Let me show you how our mind works. If I tell you these numbers, one, two, four, five, seven, eight, and 10, what numbers are missing? So you're saying three and six and nine. Guess what? There are no numbers missing. I told you there was these numbers. One, two, four, five, seven, eight, and ten. But see, our mind instantly goes to focus on what's missing rather than what's present. Where were the numbers missing? In your head, exactly. In your head. See, what we do is we do that. We focus that way. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Roger Crawford. I met Roger last year. We were on a speaking circuit together. Roger was born with a rare disease, I don't remember the name of it, but the result is he has one finger on his right hand and a finger and a thumb on his left hand. On his left leg, he had one toe and the knee was locked and it was deformed. And when he was about four or five years old, they amputated his leg from the knee down and he has a prosthesis or a false leg. And Roger was a guy who had an opportunity to either focus on what was missing or focus on what he had. When he started, like most kids, he'd go to school to have his hands in his pocket because he was ashamed of his hand. But his parents would always say, Roger, take your hands out of your pockets, put a smile on your face, and go out there and do something. He said, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Find out what your something is and go do it. Well, Roger wanted to play football. So he went out and the coach said, come on, kid, give me a break. You got a wooden leg here and you know what, you can't even, no fingers and you can't hold the ball. He said, I want to try out anyway. So the coach let him try out. Roger made the team, became a first string defensive end. His great goal in life was to intercept the pass and run for a touchdown. One day he was going in on the play, the quarterback went to throw the ball, it was tipped up in the air, and Roger leaped for it and caught it in his arms, because he couldn't cut it with his fingers, caught it in his arms, hugged it to his chest, and he started to run toward the goal line. Got about six yards from the goal line, this guy grabbed his false leg. <laughs> And Roger pulled, and this guy pulled, and Roger pulled, and this guy pulled, and Roger's leg came off, and Roger hopped on one leg <laughs> the final six yards and got his touchdown. <laughs> Roger just got married recently. Always wondered who would ever want to hold his hand when he only had one finger. And he met a woman that brought him in. He's a speaker. He talks about overcoming handicaps. And he got married, and now he's thinking about having a kid. See, he went on, and he produced a life that worked. And we can do that as well. Imagery, the power of images. Images are even more powerful than thought. So what we have to do is we have to learn to control the images in our mind or they will control us. One of the things I often ask people to do is to close their eyes and imagine they're standing in the middle of a small terrace on top of the tallest skyscraper in the world and at the edge of this terrace there's no railing. And then to walk to the edge and when they get to the edge look down now you guys have your eyes open and some of you are already like, I can see your faces tightening up and you stop breathing, see? And then I ask people, what did they experience? They say, my stomach got tight. I started to sweat. My palms got sweaty. My heart started beating faster. My knees got shaky. I felt dizzy. Then I say, where was your body in this chair? What was it responding to? The image in my head. See, because your body cannot tell the difference between a real event and a vividly imagined event. Now there's bad news and good news about that. The bad news is you can scare the heck out of yourself. You ever been going across town to a doctor's appointment and you're late? And you're imagining when you get there the doctor's going to be mad at you, you're going to miss your appointment. See, and you make yourself miserable, right? And then you get there and guess what? The doctor's late. You have to wait an hour in order to get your appointment. Well, who made you miserable all the way across town? You did, by imagining what we call a catastrophic event. See, the opposite is what we call an anastrophic event. It's where you imagine the best. I used to work for W. Clement Stone, I mentioned earlier. We used to call Stone an inverse paranoid. <laughs> he literally believed the world was plotting to do him good. <laughs> Truly. He'd send someone out to Iowa to sell insurance, and they'd come back and they'd say, we can't sell in Iowa. He'd say, why not? They're all Amish, Mennonites out there. They're clannish. You can't get in. He'd say, great. He'd say, great. Great. Why is that great? Hey, it's clan, it's wonderful. Sell one, you'll sell them all. We just got to get into that first one. He says, but they're really tight with their money. Great! He says, why is that great? He says, we sell insurance, dummy. That's how you get people to protect their money. Every negative he would see in a positive. He used to have a little phrase, in every negative event is the seed of an equal or greater positive. 
That's where that old phrase, if life hands you a lemon, squeeze it and make lemonade comes from. So he was always visualizing the positive outcome because when you visualize the negative, your body will tighten up, freeze up. When you visualize the positive, you create what you want. The most powerful of all the psychological functions is imagery. It really overrides everything else. You know, I can scare myself to death by fantasizing something scary happening, and I can also get myself very happy thinking about something good that's going to happen. We call that a catastrophic and an anastrophic expectation. You know, we all know about catastrophes. All you have to do is sit on an airplane next to someone who's got white knuckles and they're holding on real tight, and you talk to them and say, what's going on? Well, I'm fantasizing about the plane crashing, or I'm not sure we're going to land well. So they're making themselves crazy by imagining a negative event that hasn't happened yet. But see, you can also use your mind to do the other, and that's to imagine a positive event. So every time I'm landing the plane, I imagine myself already off the plane, talking to somebody, being where I want to go, and having a good time. So that's what we call an anastrophic expectation. I have a friend who's a behavioral psychologist. He says self-esteem is real simple. He says that if someone has something they can look forward to, and if they have things about themselves they like, they're going to have self-esteem. So he even teaches teachers in schools when kids come into the door in the morning to shake their hand and say, what are you looking forward to tonight, Johnny? Oh, we're having macaroni and cheese at my house. I really like macaroni and cheese. So the same thing is true as an adult. If I'm going to a meeting and I'm not looking forward to it, I don't feel real good. But if I'm going to a meeting and I look forward to it because I know good things are going to happen, I feel great. So what we want to do is start imagining that good things are always going to happen. Start imagining that I'm always going to be accepted. Start imagining that my proposals get funded, etc. Not only will you feel good in the moment, but even more importantly, perhaps, is the fact that if I imagine positive things, it kicks into gear the subconscious in my mind that starts thinking about ways to produce that positive result. It draws creativity out of my unconscious. It's the way we turn on our creativity is by having some result we want out there. I mean, the Wright brothers wanted to fly. They had a picture. They knew what they wanted. And then their creativity kept coming up with solutions to that problem. And so if I want something in my life, whether it's a personal quality, like to be relaxed in a tough situation, or to be more assertive with my boss, or to be more calm and playful with my clients if I'm a salesperson, or if I want to have a certain result, like a bigger house or more money, as long as I keep visualizing that, that's what turns on the switch of my creative unconscious, and then I start having the ideas to produce the result. So you have to change your self-image by visualizing positively. Let me give you an example. Your image of yourself is so powerful that you can't do anything that doesn't match that image. When I do experiential workshops, I'll have half the group on one side of the room and half the group on the other, and I'll ask the one side to close their eyes and visualize a seagull. You know what a seagull is? It's out there and it's flying in the ocean, and it's smooth and graceful, and its wings are just flapping gently. Maybe it's just riding on a thermal. And then the other group I ask to visualize a jackhammer, you know, out on the street, you know, where it's breaking up the concrete and it's going up and down, up and down, up and down, rapid, staccato, rigid, fast movements. Then I ask the people that are visualizing the seagull to move like a jackhammer. And what you get is you see these people with their arms out and they're trying to move like a jackhammer, but they can't do it. It's like they do this little move and then they stop. Then their arms go out, and then they kind of look graceful, and then they stop again. There's this little jerk, and they stop again. But they can't really move like a jackhammer. And then I ask the people that are a jackhammer to move like a seagull. Keep holding that image in your head of the jackhammer as if your life depended on it, and move like a seagull. And what you get is you get these people with their arms out, and they're bouncing up and down real fast. And they look like a seagull that's drank too much coffee or something. <laughs> you know? And the point we make is that you cannot hold one image in your mind and do something that's opposite of that image. It's impossible. We ask people, what did you feel when you were doing that? They say, I felt confused. I felt stuck. I felt like I often feel in my life. And so the point I want to make here is that you've got to change your self-image or you can't do new things. If your self-image is, I'm overweight, you can't lose weight. We often tell people, take a picture of your head, cut it off, take Cheryl Teague's picture out of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue and put your head on top of it. So when you go to the refrigerator, that's what you see. Because otherwise you have an image of the opposite. Let me give you an example of how you can change your self-image and how that can change your behavior. I have a friend named Dr. Jerry Jampolsky, lives in Marin County in California, and he's a psychiatrist. And he works 
right now mostly with terminally ill children, people who have leukemia and who have cancer. And if you go and see him, he got these little kids in there, they're bald heads because of the chemotherapy and the radiation treatment and so forth. And he's a beautiful man. He teaches these kids how to visualize themselves in terms of releasing themselves to the disease, sometimes overcoming it, but sometimes just accepting, you know, how to die and surrender to that in a way that's graceful and at peace with yourself. And he mentioned in an interview in the newspaper that he used guided imagery and visualization as a way to help people do that. And he said in the interview that visualization was the most powerful tool that was available for change. Someone at the school board in Marin County read this and came to him and said, look, we're having a real difficult time with our remedial reading students. I wonder if you could come over and use this visualization stuff and see if you can speed up their ability to learn reading. He said, well, I don't know if that'll work or not, but let's give it a shot. What he did was he goes over and he has the kids close their eyes and visualize going into a building, going up to the 10th floor, coming out of the elevator into a lobby of a movie theater. In this lobby is a bathtub. They go over to the bathtub and they stand in it and there's a hose coming out where the faucet would be and they take out their brain. They unzip the top of their head, they take out their brain and with this hose they wash out all of the negative thoughts. I can't read, this is too hard, I'll never learn, I'm stupid, that kind of thing. And the students watch all of these thoughts like little gray dirt go down the drain. Then they put their brain back in their head they zip it closed, they get out of the bathtub, they go into the movie theater and they sit down. And then they see projected up on the screen a picture of them reading well. They see themselves sounding out the words, having their parents say, I'm so proud of you, hearing the teacher say, good job, Johnny or Mary, I'm so proud of you. And then they go out of their chair, and they walk up to the screen, and they literally go in the screen, and now they look at the movie as if they're in the movie. See, right now, if you're watching a movie, of you, you see your whole body up on the screen. But when you're in the movie, you just see your own hands. You're looking out through your own face. You can't see your own face right now. We call this associated imagery versus disassociated imagery, which is more powerful to produce change. So whenever you visualize something you want, visualize it from inside of your body, what it would look like if you had it. Don't see yourself outside of yourself. It's not as powerful. Then he had the kids come out of the screen, sit back in their chair, Take this movie screen and shrink it down to the size of a postage stamp, still a three-dimensional, super scope, technicolor, Dolby sound movie, okay? And so then they would take this picture of themselves reading well, stick it in their mouth and chew it up. And each of these crumbs from this chewing up would go down their throat, into their stomach, and then out into their bloodstream. And then every cell in their body eventually had a picture of them reading well. Have you ever been in a TV store where there's 100 televisions all tuned to the same channel? And you know, one guy swings a bat and you see a hundred bats swing. What's well, that kind of picture? Every cell in your body. Then he had the kids open their eyes and then he had them record this little journey in their own voice onto a tape recorder. He asked them then to listen to this every morning when they got up and every night before they went to sleep. Two and a half months later, they retested the kids. They also retested kids who had not been in the study, who'd not learned this technique. What they found was that these children increased their reading scores, their reading levels, two and one half years in a little over two months. The average kid that had been in school had not done this technique, had only increased a little under two months. That's how powerful it is when you change your self-image. They didn't change the reading teachers, they didn't change the textbooks, they didn't change the instructional technology. The only thing that changed was what? That's right, the self-image, the image they had of themselves in their head. What happens in life is that any time I think about doing something, I first compare it with my self-image. And if my self-image is a picture of myself that says, no, you don't do that kind of thing well, or here's a memory in my memory bank of you know not dancing well or having people laugh at me when I was a kid, then I instantly pull back from the event. And so a negative self-image is just as powerful as a positive self-image. I'll do whatever it takes to keep fulfilling that negative image. Every image draws me toward its conclusion my picture of myself is like a goal. It's a goal image. And so if my picture of myself is someone who doesn't dance, then when I go to a party, if someone asks me to dance, my little picture comes down and says, no, you're not a dancer, don't do that. So I don't experiment, I don't try, I don't have fun, I don't learn how to dance, all right? If my picture is I'm a $3,000 a year salesman, and then someone offers me a big order, I'll probably screw it up, because that's not who I am. Or I'll say, 
Oh, that's a pretty big order. We better call John in on that one. He handles the big orders, see? And so I stay in that zone of my self-image. That's why it's so vital to change my self-image, because I'm never going to be able to produce more than my image of myself. And yet, I created it. See, the neat thing about self-image and self-concept is I created it, because I made decisions when I was a little kid, and I locked those images in. So if I decided it, I can undecide it and redecide it and reprogram it and start to have a new image of myself. Here's a couple techniques you can use. One's called the success review. And what I'd like you to do is to divide your life into thirds. Let's say you're 45 years old, be 0 to 15, 16 to 30, and 31 to 45. And what you do is you write down three successes you've had in each period of your life. And in my advanced seminar, I ask people to make a list of 100 successes you've had. Sometimes you get down to, I learned to walk. <laughs> you know, learned to ride a bicycle, got my driver's license. See, but those are important, and now we take them for granted. And then I ask you at the end of that to make three successes you'd like to have in the next five years, three goals you have that you'd like to complete. Another technique is called the success recall. You simply think of a success, close your eyes, and you see yourself reliving a success you had. And what that does is it brings into the body the same sensations and the biochemistry shifts and you get a more positive flooding of emotion in your body and it literally can propel you into more success as well as just feeling good. And when you do that, you want to see what you saw, hear what you heard, and feel what you felt. So it's auditory, visual, and kinesthetic input. Now a lot of people I've done this in workshops with, they'll say to me, you know, Mr. Canfield, I ain't got no successes. I don't have any. I remember here in Chicago, I was working with a school system. We were going around a circle, and there were kids, and a sophomore in high school, I think, about 16 years old. And it was her turn. She said, Mr. Canfield, I ain't got no successes. I noticed she was wearing a beautiful jumper, like a plaid jumper. And I said, did you pick that out, thinking she'd say yes? And she said, no. I thought, hmm. <laughs> then she said, I made it. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to sew with plaid. When you get a little darts in there, you try to get those lines to match up, it's hard. And this looked, as we said in West Virginia, store-bought. It was beautiful, but she ain't got no successes. I said, honey, that's a great success. She said, no, it's not. I said, why not? She said, because it's what I have to do. What do you mean? Turns out her mother was an alcoholic on welfare. She worked at McDonald's after school. Whatever money she got, she bought material, and then she'd take it home, borrow her aunt's sewing machine, and make her own clothes. I said, what else do you have to do? I have to get my brothers and sisters up in the morning because my mom's always hung over, make sure they eat breakfast, make sure they get to school on time. Wow, but I ain't got no successes. I said, young lady, you're more successful than half the 30-year-old mothers I know because you're raising your family. And so in terms of building up your self-esteem, you have to acknowledge all of the things you've done and reframe the way you hold it. I used to teach school, and 35 kids would be in my class. I'd teach a lesson, 30 kids would get it, five kids wouldn't. Who would I think about all the way home? Five kids who didn't get it. When I was a salesperson in the summers, and I would sell things, I'd go out and make six sales calls that day, perhaps, and I'd make one sale. Now, if I made the sale at the end of the day, I'd think about, wow, I made a sale. But if I made the sale early in the day, and then I had five people that didn't buy, who do I think about all that night? The five people that didn't buy. See, the idea is I'm focusing on the negative instead of on the positive. Each of you has what we call a life purpose, a purpose for being here. Like a carnation, when it grows up, becomes a carnation, and a rose becomes a rose, and they can't become each other because inside them is the seed of that essence, the DNA is laid out. And so the same is true for you. And in order to have high self-esteem and be effective, you need to get in touch with your life purpose. Companies have mission statements and purpose statements that give them direction as to what they should be doing. We need to be in touch with that in ourself. And when we tune into our high self, we can get in touch with that. Let's look at the most powerful, perhaps, of all the functions, and that's our mind. How many of you talk to yourself? Can I see a show of hands? Almost everyone in the room. One guy didn't raise his hand. He's sitting back there going, do I talk to myself? I don't think I talk to myself. Wait a second. Psychologists tell us we think 50,000 thoughts a day, between one and 5,000 thoughts an hour. And many of those thoughts are about ourselves. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't dress right. What's wrong with me? I'm not smart enough. I'll never get that job I want. No one respects me. The economy isn't right. No one understands me. I'll never get organized. Now, I know none of you have ever thought thoughts like that, right? 
but we think like that all day long. And what happens is it affects us.